Good morning, friends. My name is Darren St. George, and welcome to another Sal St. George Monday morning virtual road trip. We are thrilled to have you with us. If you've been with us before, welcome back. It's always a pleasure. If this is your first time, welcome to the party, because this is how we start every week, celebrating entertainment's leaders, legends, and icons, and this morning is no exception. This morning, we're heading to Denver, Colorado, and we're going to be visiting the Molly Brown Museum. If you could, please, throughout today's program, make sure to keep your camera and your microphone on mute. We appreciate that in advance. Next week, we are going to be talking about the 50th anniversary, the 50th anniversary of All in the Family. Can you believe it's been so long? And the film, the television show is still as relevant as ever. If you have any questions, we want to hear them. Please share your questions, your thoughts, your memories in the chat feature, either on Zoom or Facebook. We'll be monitoring both and happy to relay those over for you. Also today, we have two very special guests. We have Jen Kindrick. She's going to be on camera giving our tour. And we also have Kim Popetz will be walking us through the museum. So let's get started with the man of the hour. Sal, Dad, are you there? And I also always want to note, we have John Higgins behind the scenes, making sure everything runs smoothly. Hey, Pop, good how are you doing? Good morning, son, and good morning, John. I've been looking forward to this one so much, uh, simply because that trailer that you just saw, we're about to debunk the entire uh, story of Molly Brown and tell you the true story, which is just as fascinating. And I'm surprised they haven't done a motion picture based on just her life. But we'll find out about that. Maybe there was one made. I don't even know at this point. Yeah, let's so. find out. Oh, wow. And I see everybody <laughs> letting us know where they're calling in from. I'm happy to see that. That's great. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> All right, let's get over to Denver, Colorado. All right, Jen, Kim, are you two there? Oh, hey, my up? name is... Oops. Yep, go for it. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Kim Popetz, and I'll be your guide this morning as we look at the home of the unsinkable Margaret slash Molly Brown. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I do have a colleague with me, Jen Kindick. She's fantastic. She'll be running the camera, and she will also be taking questions in the chat and relaying them to me. So if you have any questions at any point during this tour, please don't hesitate to throw them in the chat, and we will answer them um, as soon as we can when it fits into the tour. So hey, we are starting hey, out Kim. on the front. Yes. Yeah. How long have you been at the museum? I have been with the museum for five and a half years. And do you keep learning something new about Molly all the time? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Um, especially, you know, the pandemic has brought a lot of changes with it, but one of the good changes that has come with the pandemic is it gave us more time to do some in-depth research into Margaret and her husband, JJ Brown. And so we have learned volumes of new material over the last year and a half. And it's really changed our understanding of, of their life and their family. Yeah, and I, I, I concur because even on my end, uh, things that I've worked on in the past, I'm revisiting, and you're right. Uh, there's a lot of new material that can be adapted to uh, today's world. And the pandemic did change all of us. And, if, you know, if anything positive came out of the pandemic is we would have never met because it was the it was the pandemic that caused us the, the idea of putting together a celebrity museum tour. So I'm going to let you take it away. Go ahead. All right. Well, we're starting out on the front porch of the house. Now, uh, Sal and Darren asked me to dispel some of the myths about Margaret Brown. And one of the first things that I will dispel is that we are not standing in front of a, muse of a mansion. This is a very large home. It's about 7,500 square feet, but it is not the mansion that you see in the movie that uh, you just saw the trailer for. And it is a beautiful home, um, but it is not like the movie. The other thing you'll notice as we go through this tour is that I call her Margaret Brown. That is because Molly was a creation of the gentleman who wrote the musical, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, on which the movie is based. So that so movie, Richard, that, that move, that play uh, was written by Meredith Wilson. And that was a follow up to his other hit, The Music Man. Yes. 
And Meredith Wilson, we have his liner notes from when he was writing the music for that musical. And he says in those liner notes that Margaret is too hard to work into song. But so he needs a different name for her. Should he call her Maggie? Should he call her Molly? And he decided to go with Molly. And that's how she became the unsinkable Molly Brown. Wow. Just and while we don't <clears throat> call her Molly. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> just because it's more poetic, it's easier to rhyme with. And <laughs> the syncopation is more <laughs> adept. <laughs> Exactly. That's the entire reason. But that was the precursor to the movie. And the movie was a, a huge success. And so Margaret forever after became Molly in the public's eye. However, we call her Margaret because that's what she was called in her lifetime. But we are grateful to that movie because this house would not have been saved without it. Well, so, here, here's an important on, here's an important question then. Did Margaret have as beautiful a singing voice as we just witnessed? That's <laughs> <laughs> you know, Margaret did sing, and in fact, she spent time in Germany. She lived in Germany for a couple of years where she learned to yodel. And we have been told that she <laughs> would practice her yodeling on the front, not the front porch here, but there's a balcony above us. We have heard stories that she would practice her yodeling on the balcony. So maybe she didn't sing for people, but she did yodel in her. I love that. I love that idea. <laughs> oh, I think oh, we. Love I'm it. sure her neighbors do. Yeah. Um, it, just to give you, a, just to give you a heads up, house, um, Kim, we're getting a little bit of a of a delay just based on your Wi-Fi settings. So it, maybe when you get closer inside, it'll be a oh. bit stronger. Oh, hopefully so. Thank you for the heads up on that. Yep. Um, so I. I just wanted to share, you know, we start out on the front porch because community was so important to both Margaret and her husband, JJ. Um, they moved to Denver in 1894 and purchased this house. And when you're out here, there is something you, there are things you can see on the front porch that really speak to that feel of community. And one of those is the cathedral. And I don't know if Jen has the photo of the cathedral or can pan to the cathedral, but there is the Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception that we can see from our front porch. We can see the spires. Um, it's harder now with the trees in full bloom, but the cathedral was one of those community projects that Margaret was a huge part of. The Catholic Church actually came to Margaret Brown and said, can you please help us? We need to raise the final $20,000 needed to complete the construction of this cathedral and Margaret stepped up and this project was really a keystone project and Margaret's sort of establishment as one of the main community members who could do big things for the growing Denver community. So I'd like to invite you all to come into the house to learn a little more about this beautiful home. Come on. So we are now standing in the entryway, uh, the entrance hall of Margaret and JJ's home at 1340 Penn here in Denver. And as you can see, it's pretty ornate. There's a lot going on in this entryway. Um, and one of the things that you can really note in this space are the fact that this is a truly modern home for the time it was built. We have a chandelier that's above my head. It is the last remaining original chandelier in the house. And it's important in, in understanding what they were looking for and how they led their lives because this house was built in 1894 and it was fully wired for electricity at that time, which was a massive leap of faith given how brand new the technology was. We also have in this room a radiator, because they had central heat. We have a telephone. There are a lot of things that make this a really modern house. And you can see why it'd be really desirable for a new and newly wealthy family uh, that just moved to Denver. Is the, the uh, thing, is the radiator, is the phone, are those the original items? 
The radiator is original. Um, the radiators were installed by Margaret and JJ because this house was built with a central heating system, but it was a, an it was a steam heat sort of forced air system with vents at the bottoms of the walls, which I didn't even know was an option in 1894 until I worked here, but it was a new technology. The heat was really uneven. And so Margaret and JJ converted the boiler so that it would run radiators. So the radiators are original to when the Browns lived here. The telephone, however, and I don't know if Jen, wa Jen wants to take a look at the telephone. The telephone is a replica that was made for us by the phone company. Um, based on their archival records of the phone that was provided to this house when the Browns lived here. So while it's not their original phone, it's a replica of the original phone that they had. The other thing that I love pointing out in this space is that we have objects here from Margaret and JJ's travels. Once they uh, made their money, they wanted to see the world. And so you can see on the mantel place behind me, these um, lamps from India, Margaret and JJ. If we can JJ. close in on that. Yeah, sure. Let's get, can you yeah, close get real in on close. the lamps? Yeah. Let's, yeah. There we go. <laughs> nice. So those lamps are from a trip that Margaret and JJ took around the world um, in 1902. And one of the places they went was India. They also went to Japan. They went to Europe. They traveled extensively for many months and they brought back souvenirs and they were really people of the world. And what was also really interesting about it is that when Margaret traveled, she wrote stories for newspapers about their trips and what she saw and what she learned. And so Margaret was a writer as well as everything else that she did. And so I love pointing these out for folks. Uh, We're going to move into, Kim, yeah. You mentioned after they made their money, where did the money come from? Great question. So JJ was um, working in the mines. JJ had started working in the mines as a teenager uh, when he was in Pennsylvania, where he grew up and he moved out West. And in the eight, late 1800s, he was a mine owner. He was a mine supervisor. He had done engineering and he was a part owner of a mine called the Little Johnny up in Leadville, Colorado. Um, if anybody out there watching this has ever been to Leadville, you know it is the highest city in the United States, the highest municipality. It's at over 10,000 feet. It's a tough place to live. And that's where the Little Johnny is. And they found in 1893 the largest vein of gold and high-grade copper ever discovered in North America at that time. Um, and that is where all the money came from. So while Margaret is always the focus of our story, without JJ, so many of the things that she did wouldn't have been possible. Do you have a photo of Molly? Yes, we definitely have photos of Margaret. Um, okay. We're going to bring one up right now. Yeah, it's great. Oh, so yes, I don't we're think she show bears you... any resemblance to uh, Debbie Reynolds. <laughs> you know, in some we had the photo that you're seeing is a very young Margaret. So it's the photo of the family. And so you see Margaret standing with JJ seated. Their daughter, Helen, is on JJ's lap and their son, Larry, is standing next to Margaret. And this is in Leadville before they moved down to Denver. Um, and no, she doesn't look anything like Debbie Reynolds in the movie. But we have a later photo of her where I think she does look a little bit more glamorous and more like the Debbie Reynolds version of Molly Brown. Um, and you should be able to see it right now. She mm -hmm. is wearing an elegant white dress and she really did have red hair. So she's got that red hair piled up on her head. She would have been an incredibly striking. Oh, it's the one with the cross. Sorry, I, I thought you were seeing a different picture. The one you see, but she did have red hair like Debbie Reynolds, so she would have been a really striking figure. Was she a very religious woman? She was a very religious woman. She and JJ were both devout Catholics. Um, and so after 24 years of marriage, they actually separated, but they never divorced because their their faith would not allow that. So they remained separated until they later both died. Um, we do have a question. How did they meet? How do they meet? So uh -huh. Margaret's brother, Daniel. So Margaret was one of six children. Hang on, just let me close that. Margaret was one of six children and she had a brother, Daniel, who 
when they were growing up in Missouri, dreamed of moving west and following the gold rush, which he did. And then he invited Margaret and their other sister out to visit him in Leadville. He had already become friends with J.J. Brown. And so upon arriving in Leadville, Margaret met J.J. at her sister-in-law's house, or I pardon me, her other sister's house, who had also moved to Leadville. And um, they spent a little bit of time together. In fact, three months after meeting, they were married. So Thank family you. connections. Yeah. So just uh, maybe we should be doing this with pre-Titanic and post-Titanic. So we have an idea when things were occurring. Uh, the children and all, they were, uh, she already had the children prior or? Absolutely. So Titanic, just to remind those who don't recall, the Titanic happened in April of 1912. Margaret and JJ had their children in Leadville uh, pre-1894, because 1894 is when they moved down here to Denver. And so, so much of Margaret's story actually happens pre-Titanic. Um, the writing that, she, some of the writing that she did, some of the initial um, community works that she did, obviously JJ finding that vein of gold and then becoming millionaires, all of that is pre-Titanic. Okay. Uh, okay. And questions? I should also note, because this question always comes up, people will ask, was JJ on the Titanic with Margaret? And the answer is no, because they had separated three years prior to the Titanic. So she was sailing alone. Sounds good. Okay, next All right, part. we're gonna move on to our drawing room. So let's keep go. And Jen's gonna show you around a little bit as we make that move. Is the furniture original? So what you see as we move through the house, approximately 15% of it or so is original to the Brown family, but everything in our home is over a hundred years old. It's not recreations, it's everything is from that time period. What we are recreating though, is what the house looked like in 1910. Um, and we are in the drawing room, and I believe Jen has a historic photo of the drawing room that she's going to share with you from 1910. And as you look at that photo, you will see when we switch back to the actual room that we did our best to faithfully recreate what you see in that 1910 photo. So the whole house is restored to 1910. And we're so grateful to have these photos. In 1910, Margaret had a coming out into society party for her niece, and she had 800 people at the house. And so she had the house all gussied up for the party, and she invited a photographer in to take photos. And those photos came to light in 1979. And those were what we used to restore the house, to make it look as much as 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 much as we could to make it look like what it did when Margaret and JJ owned it. Can we see the stained glass above the uh, window? Oh, absolutely. Jen, can you show them the stained glass above the window? That is actually one of my favorite restoration stories in the whole house because when this, when Margaret died in 1932, this home was sold. Um, to uh, another family. It changed hands about six more times before Historic Denver purchased it. And in the Great Depression, they lowered these 14 foot ceilings so that, so as well to save on heating costs. And they didn't get rid of this beautiful stained glass window, which would have been partially covered by the lowered ceiling. Instead, they literally lowered the whole window so that the stained glass was still on the front of the house. And when we restored this room to its 1910 appearance, we lifted the window back up into its original position. Wonderful. So the stained, Beautiful. yeah, so the stained glass is original to the house, but it has gone up and down in its location multiple times over the years. There was a question, are Margaret's writings available? Our, so there was a question, asking if Margaret's writings are available. Some of them are um, because Margaret was published in newspapers and so her newspaper accounts are available. One of the easiest to find if you just Google it 
is Margaret's um, story, a personal story about her experience on the Titanic. It was published in Serial, um, I want to say in the Newport News. And it, she wrote that just six weeks after the sinking of the Titanic. Great question. So this is Margaret and JJ's drawing room. Um, and it's a beautiful room. And one of the things I do love about this room is actually the there's more objects from Margaret's travels, again, on the mantelpiece, um, one of which is a tray that Margaret and JJ purchased in Japan when they were on that round the world trip. And then above the fireplace, there is a painting by local Colorado artist, Helen Henderson Chain, and it's a landscape painting. And Margaret owned this painting um, and she had it on display in her home when she lived here. And it's so important to us because it talks about Margaret's support for artists, for local artists and for women artists. Helen Henderson Chain is a, a known and respected painter today, but in her time, it was very difficult to get the support of both the arts community and the general public. And she would go out in what you can imagine, 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, skirts hiking up mountains to set up her canvas and easel and paint these beautiful landscapes that you can find in museums around Denver today. And so Margaret was a big supporter of the arts, not just in her own work, but in the works of others and push that out to society. So Jen, did you she, have another question? Yeah, Oops, when she- Hang on. Oh, go ahead. Nope, go ahead, Sal. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm telling Jen to so, hang on. So when she and JJ divorced- They never kept, divorced. Okay, when they separated, she kept the house? Yes. Yes. So this is actually really interesting. In 1898, JJ transferred ownership of the house to Margaret's name. Now, they weren't having any marital issues at that time. He did it for business reasons. We have to remember that the world was very different back then. Um, there were regular bank crashes you know, every decade or so. And it made good business sense for the family home not to be in his name so that should one of his businesses go awry, they wouldn't lose the family home. So he transferred it into Margaret's name and she owned it outright until her death. So was it amicable? Did Why why did they um, split up if they, okay, I see a smile coming, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is a question we get all the time. And Honestly, my my answer, we don't have any writings from either JJ or Margaret talking about the separation. So we really don't know what their personal private reasons were. And it's I always say, you know, as someone who's been married over 20 years myself, you just have no idea what's happening in someone else's marriage. So there are hints in newspapers and things, but we just don't really know. I will say that they did. Um, have a uh, amicable relationship after the separation. JJ did pay um, Margaret a monthly stipend for her living expenses. And when JJ died 10 years prior to Margaret, Margaret um, did an interview about his death. And in it, she said that he was basically the most amazing man she'd ever known. So there was definitely still good feeling. They just, I think they, my personal feeling is that they both had very big personalities. And sometimes that's very hard to have in the same household, two giant personalities. Good answer. Okay. <laughs> Jen had a question in the chat. What was that? Oh, it was the same question. So there you go. Somebody, um, uh, we, um, in, in dispelling myths, where is she, where is she buried? She is buried in Holyrood Cemetery on Long Island. Margaret was living in the Barbizon Host Hotel in New York City when she died. Um, and JJ had died 10 years prior. And when he died, he was visiting his daughter who lived with her family on Long Island. So they are actually buried together in the same plot at Holyrood Cemetery. And here we are on Long Island, and we don't even realize this. <laughs> yes, you can go and visit, but just note that when you do that, the uh, I want to say some of the dates on the headstone are not exactly correct. Um, I believe it's Margaret's birthday is one day off. It's not correct on the headstone. So, or the yeah. year, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and, and no sign of Amali on there either. No, no <laughs> sign of Amali on there. Definitely not. We always call her Margaret because that was her name, or we call her Mrs. J.J. Brown because that's often how she signed her letters, signed her correspondence, signed her off on any articles that she wrote. Okay, so let's take, let's take it to the next spot. Yeah, let's go. We're going to move into the library now. Okay, already it's my favorite room. <laughs> <laughs> it's the books, right? Absolutely. I love it. I love the books. Um, one of the questions we often get from our guests is, did all the books belong to the Browns? And the answer is no. They are all from the time period when the Browns were living here, but they are not the Browns, with the exception of this encyclopedia set that you might be able to see there. Um, but the bookcases actually did belong to the Browns, and they're really beautiful. They are. What? Yeah, so I, I, since we're here talking about Miss and Margaret, I really want to get to the Titanic story because I feel like that's where the most most myths live uh, surrounding Margaret. So if you'll just indulge me for a moment, you know, Margaret was sailing on the Titanic. She had received a telegram that her um, first grandchild, her grandson, was ill. And so she had been on vacation with the Astors, the wealthiest people in America at that time, J.J. Astor and his new bride, Madeline, doing a tour of the Mediterranean when she gets this telegram. So she needs to get home. She wants to get home and support her son and her daughter-in-law and see the baby. And uh, so she gets on the Titanic, not because she wanted to be on this ship that had been heralded and is going to do this famous first voyage um, because up until that point, the Titanic was the thing that was being heralded as unsinkable. Um, but she was doing it to get home to family and Titanic was one of the only ships sailing at that time. So she gets on the Titanic a couple days after a couple days under sail, you know, they hit the iceberg. Everybody knows that story. I think what they don't know is that what's most important to that story to me is not what they show in the movie about the lifeboat and you know how other people may or may not have treated Margaret. What's most important to me is what she did after they were rescued. So they were picked up by the rescue ship Carpathia. And what so many people don't know about Margaret was that she was a highly educated woman. She was one of the first students at the Carnegie Institute for Women. By the time she boarded Titanic, she spoke five other languages, um, not necessarily fluently, but enough to get by. And so when the Titanic sank and they were rescued, so many of the rescued passengers were immigrants who were coming to America to start a new life. And many of them could not speak English. But with her language skills, Margaret could speak with them and she could comfort them and hear their stories of loss. And she could tell them where the ship was taking them and what might happen when they arrived. And then when they arrived in New York, she didn't disembark with the rest of the first class passengers. She stayed on the rescue ship to make sure that those third class passengers received medical attention, clothing, had a place to go once they disembarked, and she comforted them. She also started raising money aboard the rescue ship before it ever got back to New York in order to help those people. Um, she raised $10,000, which that was just in three days. She did it raising money from the first class passengers, both survivors of the Titanic and first class passengers of the rescue ship. In today's money, that would be about a quarter of a million dollars in just three days. Um, so what she did and what's important about her Titanic story is really her compassion and the care that she took for all of those around her. And there are plenty of newspaper articles where she, she's asked about this and she says, you know, I don't think anyone else would have done less than what I did if they were able. I had, there was something that needed to be done and I was there and I could do it. So I stepped up. Um, and that I think really encompasses her whole character. Does right. anyone have any Titanic that's a, that's a, questions? <laughs> that's a great, great, great uh, story that nobody ever uh, delves into. Um, no. 
You said initially that she was friends with the Astors. Yes. And when they boarded the lifeboats, did she get on with Madeline? Because we know that J um, uh, Mr. Astor um, uh, died on board. But uh, did he, did she uh, come from, because Madeline was pregnant at the time. Yes, she was. Um, she was really not much more than a girl and she was pregnant. Um, as far as I'm aware, Madeline was in a different lifeboat from Margaret. So when the Titanic, when they were trying to evacuate Titanic and get people into the lifeboats, Margaret, of course, being the woman she was, she stepped in to help. And many of the people on the Titanic didn't really believe it could sink. It had been called unsinkable. Why on earth would this be sinking? So they didn't want to get onto the boats. And many people, because sort of the custom of the sea was women and children first, many of the women didn't want to leave their husbands or their older sons behind, and they were refusing to get into the boats. So Margaret stepped in convincing women to get into lifeboats. And she was in the middle of doing this when some of the crew saw her and recognized her as one of the first class passengers who should already be in a lifeboat herself. And they literally picked her up bodily and dropped her over the side of the Titanic into a lowering lifeboat. It was a, probably about a four foot drop um, because they felt she should already be gone. So she didn't really have a choice as to which lifeboat she was in and who her companions were. Are there any interpretations? Because there have been numerous uh, motion pictures based on Titanic. Yes. Are any of them uh, that, that you would say, yes, that is Margaret? <sighs> Honestly, most of the interpretations speak to sort of this mythical Western woman who's rough and tough and crude talking. And none of those things really describe Margaret, but that is how she's portrayed. Even in the James Cameron movie, which when they worked, they worked really hard to get so many of the details right about Titanic and they did an extraordinary job. They still fell back on that trope of this mythical Western woman when they had Kathy Bates portray Margaret. So even in that movie, it's not a great um, example, really, of who Margaret was. Who would you cast? If who you would were, I cast? If you were the casting agent. <laughs> who would be the best representation? And it could be somebody from the past. It doesn't matter. Would you take Honest, like a Joan, Would you take a Joan Crawford? Would you take an Olivia <laughs> de Havilland? You know, who would you think would be more suitable for that role? I don't think Kathy Bates was unsuitable. I think the way they had her play the role was inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So I think Kathy Bates could have done a great job portraying Margaret as she actually was, but that wasn't how she was directed to play the role. So, exactly. but yeah, someone like, oh gosh, someone really outsized like Joan Crawford or an Elizabeth Taylor would be amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. I, guess, I guess Roseanne Barr would be out. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not the way we want to go with that. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move into our next space. We're going to take a look at JJ's study. And by the way, um, our guys are they're, are they're terrific at this. They've already linked to the um, writings of uh, Margaret, and you can get them right here uh, in our chat. And also I want to note coming up in just a moment are more links um, to the museum. If you want to go there, we suggest you support and donate as you see fit. And we're also about to drop in more links for Sal's programs next Monday and the following. So that's to come. Thank you so much for that. So we are in JJ's study. Um, one of the great things about this study, there's a couple of really great things in this study. Um, one of them is right next to me. There's this fantastic map of all the mining claims in Leadville. And the, the little Johnny mine is one, it's, it's very tiny and even standing here, I can't see it exactly. But the little Johnny is one of those yellow squares right in the center of the map. Um, and it is just, you can see there were mining claims everywhere. So one of the great things about this story of JJ finding this, this huge vein of gold is that 
and Jen's taking a close up of the little Johnny photo of the little Johnny itself. One of the great things about this story is um, JJ and his partners, John Campion and a few others, um, they had actually found the vein of gold a year before they made it known to the public. So they found this vein of gold and as, as they're examining it, they realize that it's not it's not a straight shaft down. It's it sort of goes down and it curves around and it moves all over the place. And if they want to lay claim to the whole thing legally, they have to buy up all this land around their original claim because the shaft moves and it goes under these other claims. So they can't tell anyone what they found because then they won't be able to buy this other land. So they keep it quiet for an entire year while they buy all these other parcels. And then they make the announcement. And the announcement was really fortuitous because in 1893, the United States suffered a recession because of a silver crash. And silver had been the number one mineral coming out of the mines of Leadville. And so this was, this was great timing on their part. It kept a lot of people employed who otherwise would have lost their jobs. And um, it made the Browns famously wealthy. The other thing that I really love about this room, and it's right behind Jen, so I apologize, Jen. It's a map or a, draw, a hand sketch that Margaret's daughter, Helen, made of this first floor of this house. And the reason I love this is because we only got a hold of this a handful of years ago, and it completely changed our interpretation of the room where I'm standing in right now. We didn't know what this room was used for, but then we got a hold of this sketch that Helen made later in her life. And it clearly says on it, father's room um, study. So that's how we knew what this room was. Prior so to that, she, we used She showed it. you where the desk would go and I, I, that's what, uh, it's hard to uh, see it. It's the, hard to see it, I yeah. agree. It's, it's a schematic of the entire first floor. So okay. it just tells us the names of each room, but I think it's, it's great because it's just a little piece of history that really confirms what we thought we knew. And it also gave us brand new information so that we could really talk about J.J. Brown. But that, you know what, that is what we live for. Um, when we find a little piece of research that is uh, finally comes to the surface that nobody knew about, that is that is a godsend when you get that. Absolutely. We yeah. love it here. And unless you're into the historic world, you don't appreciate how important it is when you find those little nuggets. Yes. I'm going to share with you just two tiny more little nuggets in this room because I they're two of my favorite pieces in the house. And they're this desk that I'm standing next to and the chair in front of it. Oh. Dad, did you just get a freeze? Yeah. And then a yeah. gentleman named Charles. Oh, okay. Hang on. Hold on. Yep. <laughs> Kim, can yep. you go back a little bit? Let's try that again. You just have a weak signal in this room. Okay. So I just wanna share two more pieces of history in this room that aren't necessarily connected to Margaret and JJ, but I love them because they are such great pieces of history. They were donated to the museum a couple decades ago by the same gentleman. And it's this desk and this chair. This desk belonged to Colorado's first US Senator, Henry Teller. And he was in office when the Browns lived in this house. And the chair sitting in front of it belonged to Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. And so while they're not directly related to the Browns, they're fabulous pieces of history. So I love them. Lovely. Wonderful. Kim, we have a question. Can you tell us a little bit more about the children? Sure, absolutely. Um, so Margaret and JJ were very much all about family. Um, and they had two children of their own, uh, their first a uh, child was a son named Larry Brown La or Lawrence Palmer Brown. Um, and then their second child born two years later was named Catherine Ellen Brown, but they called her Helen. Uh, so Larry and Helen were just seven and five years old when their dad made that, found that vein of gold and the family moved from Leadville to Denver. 
um, <laughs> at some point in life, uh, when she was a little bit older, Helen was interviewed for a newspaper article and she said in it, when Larry and I were, were young, we thought we had the best mother in Denver, um, which I just think is so sweet and really speaks to the relationship they had with their mom. Now, um, Larry being the older one, Larry and Helen both attended schools um, all around the United States and in Europe. Um, Larry attended the Colorado School of Mines uh, for university. And he also served in World War I. So he served in World War I on the Hindenburg Line as an officer. Just a few weeks after arriving, he was exposed to a mustard gas attack and he had to be evacuated um, for medical treatments. And he, um, he received an honorable medical discharge from um, service and came back to Colorado. He had been married to a woman named Eileen. Um, she was the mother of the little boy that Margaret was racing back on the Titanic to see because he was so ill. Um, but Larry and, and uh, his first wife, they actually divorced, um, much to the horror of Margaret and JJ. Um, and he went on to try a few other um, pursuits, a few other professions, one of which was making movies in Hollywood. He became a movie producer. And on the set of one of these movies, he met the woman who really was the love of his life, a silent movie star named Mildred. And they married and they were married until his death in 1949. His sister, Helen, had a very different life. Um, she went to finishing schools in Europe. She attended the Sorbonne for university. Um, she was presented at court um, at the same time that, that the coronation of King George happened. Um, so she, she was very much a society girl. She fell in love with and married a gentleman named George Benzinger of the Benzinger publishing family. Um, they were very wealthy East Coast family. And she and George settled down in Long Island and they had two children of their own. And Helen lived sort of a, a much more quiet life doing charity. She wasn't like her mom. She wasn't in the newspapers all the time. And she lived quite a long life. Um, I believe she died in 1970. Um, so she, she lived to a nice, a good age. And it was just a few years before her death that she drew that schematic that we have of the main floor of the house. Do you know um, what town she happened to live in on Long Island? Ooh, that's okay. a great question. Left she knows. Do you know what town on Long Island that Helen and George lived in? I don't think they like <laughs> we can't okay. we can't come up with it at the top of our heads. We'll have that's to all right. it's, but it's something that we can investigate for for ourselves right here. Um, right. I'm wondering if that house is I'm wondering if that house is still and, and obviously Molly uh, Margaret was here on Long Island quite frequently. Oh, did oh. we lose her? Yep, I think we froze again. Actually. Okay. Oh, hello? Freezing. Are, Jim? We, are we back? Now we, we are. We are. Yeah, yes. you know what? Why don't we try a different, uh, try a different room? This one seems to be a little, yes. a little sparse. We're gonna move, we're gonna move into the dining room. Great. I just have one comment for you. Um, the children and JJ did not know if Margaret had survived the Titanic until that list came out. So they were just mm -hmm. like everybody else wondering, was she a survivor or not? Yes, that's absolutely true. So Margaret's daughter, Helen, had been traveling with Margaret and the Astors on that trip around the Mediterranean, but Helen chose not to travel back to America. Remember she was at university in Sorbonne, it was spring and she was going to stay for some events going on in France and she didn't get on the ship with Margaret. So yeah, she, she was the only one who knew that Margaret in fact was on the Titanic. Um, and she was frantic with worry until she got the news that her mom had survived. So, we are now in the dining room. It's, it's quite a large room. Um, and you can see we have a large cutout of Margaret behind the dining room table. <laughs> uh, Margaret and JJ 
hosted a large number of dinners, parties, events in this home, often for philanthropic reasons. So much like today, when we are, you know, when folks are in the upper echelons of society, we provide them entertainment and then we ask for a charitable donation. And that's that's how it worked back in Margaret's day too. And Margaret and JJ supported a huge variety of causes, mainly here in Denver. Um, Margaret became friends with someone who at the time was incredibly famous in America. His name was Judge Ben Lindsay. He was a judge here in Denver and he created the first juvenile justice system west of the Mississippi. And so Margaret was a huge supporter of his and she raised money to help him build facilities for kids who were poor, for kids who were already in the justice system um, so that they could better their lives, so that they could get fresh air and get outside and do healthy things. She built camps for them. She helped build one of the first orphanages here in uh, Denver. She and JJ were big supporters of the church. I mentioned the cathedral when we were on the front porch, they were also big supporters of the first hospital here in Denver. Um, gosh, there are just so many different causes. The first animal shelter here in Denver. And JJ felt um, a particular responsibility to the children of miners who had died up in Leadville. So he and one of his mining partners sent um, toys and clothes every Christmas up to the orphanage in Leadville so that those children would have a little bit of something in their lives as well. So this was the setting for a whole lot of those dinners and events. And it's a pretty grand room. And so we have some great things in here. Um, one of the things that I, we, I, I don't know if Jen has the picture of it or not, and it's sort of hard to see, but there is a, a fireplace screen um, against the fireplace at the back of the room. And this screen, along with something, unfortunately, we don't have, um, really show another side of Margaret, which is that of inventor. Margaret commissioned the screen. It is thought that she designed it. It has little cups on the front of it for holding things like lavender or cinnamon so that when the fire heated up, it would heat up those, those materials and cause lovely scents like a potpourri to waft through the room. She also invented uh, an electric cart so that when her servers were serving food, the food could be kept warm as they were moving it around. So it was a rolling cart that had, you know, electricity going to it so that there could be uh, heating elements, et cetera, to keep the food warm. And she patented that. So that's a whole nother side to her personality. You mentioned how large this house is. Um, mm -hmm. did, they have a, did they have a large staff? Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by large. In the 1900 census, there were five servants living here on the property, three women and two men. Um, we believe that the women lived on the third floor of the house, and we have a carriage house behind the main house, and we believe that the men lived on the second floor of the carriage house. And they would, of course, hire in more staff for large parties, things like that. And I want to I want to point out here. I love our I love our guests because they're always <laughs> even as this is going on. We have uh, Kathleen who was doing some research and found a link. It's shared in the chat of a geneal uh, genealogy website that mentions Helen lived in Hempstead on Long Island. So we may have our answer there. There we go. Fantastic. Yep. And we have a question. That's Lucille's curious. Do you know what happened to Larry's son who was so ill? Yes. So it turned out that he just had a milk allergy and that he was not actually as ill as everyone feared. And he grew up um, and just had a very normal, happy life. So he was fine. The worry at that time, of course, it's the early 1900s. Infant mortality is very high. The idea that her first grandson could have died is is very real and I'm sure was very present in Margaret's mind because it was such a common occurrence. But he was just fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, we should be moving on to the next room. Yes, we should. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go up the main staircase and Jen is going to show you one of the most beautiful pieces of stained glass in the house as we move upstairs. Pop, just looking through these rooms, you can see how ornate they are. 
I, oh, I know yeah. we could spend so much time in each one going through all these pieces. Yeah. Wow. Well, she's right. That wow. is beautiful. Oh, oh, even more. <laughs> wow. Very nice. I guess we can ask her uh, if she knows the artist that they commissioned to put that together for them. And I love the top one, this kind of window of a window. Really, mm -hmm. yeah. really beautiful. So oh. that stained glass was created by a local stained glass family. Um, it was commissioned locally. And what what's really amazing about it is that when we restored that glass just two years ago now, the family that we hired to do it because they are the preeminent stained glass workers here in Denver, he took it out. We had no documentation as to who created the stained glass. We just knew it was made locally. And he, the gentleman who restored it, took it out and worked on it. And he is, he is a hundred percent positive that it is the work of his great, great grandfather, because they have been doing stained glass in Denver since the mid 1800s. And he even had for the one or two pieces of glass that broken, this type of glass is no longer manufactured. And he had matches in his studio that the family has been using for over a hundred years. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a great lesson to shop local. <laughs> <laughs> yes, shop local always. <laughs> so one of the other things I think gets lost in the story and the myth of Margaret or the myth of Molly Brown is the work that she did outside of America. So Margaret was heavily involved in World War I. Um, we already heard that her son, Larry, served as an officer. Margaret raised money for the Red Cross to buy ambulances during World War I. And while we, have, we are having such a hard time tracking down documentation on Margaret's exact role during World War I, however, she was given a French Legion of Honor for her work during and after the war, for her contributions. And the nominating people included Captain Rostrand, who was the captain of the rescue ship Carpathia that rescued Margaret and the other passengers during the Titanic disaster, but also um, an organization that was run in Belgium and France during the war, uh, its acronym is CARD, and I am forgetting the French, the French, you know, the longer version of CARD, but they wrote a letter of recommendation saying, you know, Margaret did all these wonderful things for us during and after the war, and she deserves to be recognized on a higher level. So she is, she is the holder of a French Legion of Honor that was presented to her in April of 1932. Um, and I think that piece of Margaret's story really gets lost when you know, we talk about the myth. Yeah, we're getting close to the end here. But yes, is there anything that we've missed that you want to uh, share with us to dispel any other uh, discrepancies about Margaret? I think the main things to remember is that Margaret wasn't ostracized by society. That is that is a huge myth. She was Catholic and therefore certain parts of society would never accept her just on those grounds, but she wasn't rough. She wasn't crude. She was well-educated. She spoke five other languages and she was tapped by the upper levels of society here in Denver to help with fundraising. And for those of you out there who've done fundraising, you know, it is impossible to raise money if people don't like you or you don't have friends and family <laughs> supporting you. So the idea that she was ostracized is just really incredible and very difficult to believe. Um, and she just, she cared so much about the world around her and people and wanting to make sure equal rights. That was something she really fought for after Titanic was equal rights for women and men. And it's something she said over and over in the newspaper articles after the Titanic sank, because she thought it was a travesty that so many men died 
when there was so much space on the lifeboats because of this rule of the sea that men had to wait for women and children to get on the lifeboats first. So, so she said, if, obviously the Titanic had an after effect on her personality. Yes. But that was very much who she was prior to the, the Titanic. I think it just re reinforced everything she already believed. Excellent. Darren, do we have any questions left in the uh, chat room? Uh, we do. Will you be able to provide a link to the recording of this virtual tour? Yes, of course. No, <laughs> no problem. Uh, we'll put a link right now in the in the chat. Uh, you can see the whole thing at SalStGeorge.com. You can see all of our our links over there. We also have links for the museum. We have uh, Lucille was just curious: Is the museum open for public visits? Yes, it is. We are open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we also do virtual tours of the museum um, the last, the fourth Saturday of every month. So even if you're still on the East Coast, you can join us for those. Um, so we are definitely open to the public and we're doing events and everything. How it's has great. the pandemic affected you? Oosh. Um, we were closed for quite a number of months in 2020 um, and the very beginning of 2021. So it, we have definitely taken a financial hit um, and we lost staff during that. Um, we are recovering and we are so grateful for every single person who walks through the door and who joins us for any type of tour, whether it be virtual, any type of event, whether it be in-person or online. Um, we're just grateful to have, have our folks back with us. Yeah. And that really uh, sums up why we do what we do. We we are we lost two museums in the last year that we know of, uh, celebrity museums. And uh, our job is just to put a spotlight on you so people can visit you or donate to you, buy something from your gift shop. Um, that's our purpose right now. Absolutely. Here, okay. before, before we go, let's give our guests one more moment. If they have any questions, anything else they would like to see, I'd like to launch a poll that we have um, and give everybody a chance to write in. Uh, <laughs> I think you may like this. Yeah, and yeah, please, uh, Jen and Kim, let's see if you, how you fare. We're curious, so many actresses have portrayed uh, Margaret Brown over the years, and we'd like to know which one of these from the list did not. So we're, look, we're oh. looking for the imposter. One of these did not. We have Thelma Ritter in 1953 in Titanic, Cloris Leachman, 1957, Telephone Time, Tucker McGuire in 1958, A Night to Remember, Tammy Grimes in 1960, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, Debbie Reynolds, 1964, The Unsinkable Molly Brown. The Ad first one is the Broadway show, Darren. The oh, Thelma Ritter? Yes. No, Tammy Grimes, uh, she won the um, Tony Award yep. for um, Unsinkable Molly Brown. Agnes Moorhead, 1974, It's Me, Margaret. Cloris Leachman, 1979, SOS Titanic. Mara Lou Henner, 1996, Titanic. Kathy Bates, 1997, Titanic. Linda Cash, 2012, Titanic. That's the Broadway show. Yes. <laughs> wow. One of them must be popping out at you. About seven of them here are, or six of them are getting attention. So that's pretty interesting. People are suspicious of Thelma Ritter. They're suspicious <laughs> of Cloris Leachman, Tucker McGuire, Agnes Moorhead, Cloris Leachman. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah, we're suspicious of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is Ag Agnes, Agnes Moorhead. Moorhead. You may remember her from Bewitched, playing mm -hmm. Samantha's mom. But uh, that was when we threw in there. We did. Yeah, nice. that does not exist. She did not play uh, did not play Margaret Brown. But all of these other actresses did. And we even had to leave some off. There are probably two or three more that I just couldn't fit into the poll question. Yeah. So it's really it's amazing how long her how her story has thrived through all these years. And, and kind of interesting after listening to all of what we've learned just now, you had almost a dozen people portraying molly brown and yeah. none of them got it right mm -hmm. <laughs> when yeah. you think about it it does she does deserve a um a, a motion picture just about her 100 can i can i throw in one last thing that might yeah. be particular interest to folks on the east coast margaret was heavily involved in the women's suffrage movement mm -hmm. and she worked with alva Belmont 
to create the Conference of Great Women in 1914, hosting some of the events at her own cottage in Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that gets lost in all those portrayals. Of Margaret Brown, nobody talks about her work, her deep involvement with the women's suffrage movement. Absolutely. And Alva had a house here on Long Island in Oakdale, uh, Eagle's Nest. Mm -hmm. But the uh, house in uh, Newport, um, she would open it up to, to, to the common people, which offended all of the society women, you know, <laughs> uh, but she opened it up to raise money for the movement. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Jen, Kim, you should know there's lots of thanks coming in in the chat so much for a wonderful presentation. We Harriet is curious. We didn't see the bedrooms. Yes, I know. We don't. <laughs> there's only oh, so, so much time. Sorry. That's okay. You know what that means? We can do this again in a couple of months and do part two. <laughs> there you go. Or Absolutely. people can join us on our virtual tour. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. You know what? We have some more information about that. Let me show you now. Here we go. You can go to brown.org. And this is their homepage. They have lots of information about the museum, but also how you can visit. And they have their prices, private tours, school tours, accessibility, and online, um, mm -hmm. online store <clears throat> and events. Right here, you can donate as well to them directly, which is always appreciated. And you can also show your support by shopping. Go to their shop and you have books to choose from. <laughs> T Titanic. Um, and this is the book here. Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> this is the book here that is recommended. It's Unraveling the Myth. And that's a lot of what we were doing today. So if you want to learn more, this is the book to do that. And these links are already provided. Thank you, John, in the chat. Go ahead, click those and enjoy. Again, if this is your first time with Sal, you can follow us over on Facebook, social media. We're there as well as Instagram. Follow us over there on Twitter. Dad is always busy on, twi on Twitter. Life with Lucy. Oh, yep. There she is. And also today's video of our virtual road trip and all of our virtual road trips. And in, in, in addition to lectures and favorite playlists, tons of information is over here at South St. George on YouTube. You can click there. And even this one playlist, this is all of our virtual road trips, well over a dozen to the John Wayne Museum, Lizzie Borden Museum, It's a Wonderful Life Museum. We uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Miss American pageant. Really incredible stuff. Go ahead, click it, and you have lots more content to enjoy. Go over to SouthStGeorge.com and you can sign up for all of our events. The next virtual road trip we have is the Edward Hopper Museum. That's coming up in August 16th, not too far away. James Dean, we're looking forward to. And then next week, here we are, 50th anniversary for All in the Family. That's that's one we've been talking about for a while, Pop. So oh, yeah. We're definitely looking forward to celebrating that 50th anniversary sign up. And our game show is always very popular. We have uh, Dan coming back again, but we always have a lot of laughs and we learn a lot in our game show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, Instagram link. Sure, you bet. Somebody just asked in the chat for that. I'll put that over here for you. There you go. Instagram link. <laughs> Enjoy. And also at SalSaintGeorge.com, you can show your support and shop. We have our virtual road trip mugs. That's what we've been drinking out of this morning. And also Sal is a big coffee fan, so you can shop for a little coffee nook sign. Keep calm. The coffee is on. One last time, Jen, Kim, thank you so much for this extraordinary tour today. This really was a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. We've loved our experience with you guys. You're great. Thank you so much. Pop, Our pleasure. always a pleasure. And everybody, we'll see you on Monday. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>